my name is Adelina Ixtene. I am a law professor at Schulich School of Law at Dalhousie. So we traveled from Halifax to be here tonight. Um, thank you so much to the community college for hosting us. Thank you, Heather, for making the liaison and uh, <coughs> making sure everything goes smoothly. And thank you to Elizabeth from Dell, who's arranged everything. And she's also my support system. <laughs> <laughs> um, as I said, I'm a law professor. And my area is quite interdisciplinary. Um, I mostly work in criminal law. I do a lot of criminal justice issues, social justice issues. Um, and I specialize in what we now call prison law. So an area that looks at particular uh, needs and um, rights, avenues, access to justice for prisoners. Um, but the research that I do, as I said, is quite interdisciplinary. It goes beyond the limits of the law into health sciences, social sciences, criminology, um, and, and so forth. For the last about seven years of my career, I've been specializing and, and looking into the healthcare needs and access to justice for vulnerable groups of prisoners, um, with specific uh, emphasis on aging prisoners. Um, and that's something that I'm going to address tonight. I'm going to go over um, some of the healthcare issues and um, availability of healthcare resources in, in prisons for aging individuals. Now, I don't want to be understood as saying that younger prisoners do not have health problems or that the treatment of younger prisoners is significantly different or much better. It's just that um, as it happens in the community, as we age, we tend to have more problems. So if there is a gap in terms of treatment, it's going to be more obvious within the groups of people that have heightened needs. So I think the aging population is a fairly interesting group um, to make a case study out of and to look at how different resources within the Correctional Service Canada are being distributed and utilized. Um, now, I'm only talking about the federal correctional system. I do not talk about the provincial system. Uh, the federal correctional system is um, the one that's running penitentiaries across the country and is where individuals who have been sentenced to two years or more are serving their sentence. So, uh, there may be more people in the provincial. We have each province has its own correctional system where people sentenced to under two years are serving their time. And there are obviously a lot of people there, but I focused on the federal system because it's there where people serving life are incarcerated, so growing old in prison. People serving indeterminate sentences are, serving very long sentences, or are in and out, in and out of prison. So for the point of view of aging, it's definitely a more, um, it's, 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 it's a more important place to look at, I would say. Um, now, I'm going to do two things tonight. Um, first of all, I am going to give, try to provide a rundown of the, what the federal correctional system looks like, what's the legal framework that is governing um, the rights of prisoners, the uh, different, uh, different activities that take place in prison, um, basically the whole prison construct. There is a framework behind it, and we're going to talk a bit about it. And we're going to see that actually on paper, um, that legal framework is quite progressive, and it's actually one of the better ones that exist um, around the world. Now, in the second part of my talk, it's not going to be as optimistic. Um, that one looks at how the law is being applied in practice within the federal system. And um, I'm going to present you with um, the result, some of the results of my study, which has been based on interviews with 200 older prisoners in penitentiaries. And um, I'm going to try to offer you the image of the older prisoners, individual that is aging in prison, the, the, the treatment that uh, he is getting, and the resources that are available, and the potential legal problems that occur when um, the law, in terms of their rights, is not applied to fullest meaning and we're gonna I'm gonna inquire into what it means for our community in terms of misapplying the law or not uh, not always considering the constitutional rights of prisoners okay so that's that's just a bit overview of what I'm going to be doing um, the pictures that you're seeing are actually of actual individuals incarcerated in Canada and the US uh, they are courtesy of photographer Ron Levine, who's a photographer in the U.S. and he's kind of dedicated his life to uh, to uh, to taking to going into prison and putting a face 
to the process of aging. Um, his, his beautiful photo album is called Prisoners of Age. It's, it's a wonderful, wonderful collection. Um, so the federal correctional system, as I mentioned, is the, uh, is the Canadian system that is bringing together all the penitentiaries across Canada and is governed by a governmental agency called um, Correctional Service Canada, um, which is responding directly to the Ministry of Public uh, Safety. And they have penitentiaries of all levels from minimum medium and maximum security uh, and multi-level for women and they exist from coast to coast. We have one here in Spring Hill um, and there is another one in Truro which is for, for women um, and there are also some other institutions such as the regional treatment center in each region there is one which is basically a psychiatric institution where people, uh, prisoners that are having acute mental disorders are being sent there for, for treatment. It's still a correctional institution, but it has this psychiatric uh, 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 kind of angle to it. Um, now, basically, prison is what we call a total institution. So it's an institution where the people that are in it are under full control of the state. So the state is the one that has to provide everything for them because their autonomy and possibility of choice have been completely uh, taken away by way of the state intervening and uh, uh, taking away their liberty. So we need a very robust framework in order to ensure that um, we are maintaining the kind of tension between the needs of, sec of security of the institution and the need of the correctional system to fulfill its purpose and the rights that these individuals have, including, for instance, to health care. People grow old in prison, people get sick in prison, and they don't have the option of going elsewhere and seeking for help, even if they have money to pay for it, right? So there is the need for the institution to provide for that kind of treatment. Um, and obviously, a lot of times, there is a tension between the provision of services and uh, the ensuring that the security of the institution is running smoothly, right? So for that, we have a very big federal piece of legislation, which is called Corrections and Conditional Release Act. And it has its companion Corrections and Conditional Release Regulation. Um, now, these pieces are regulating absolutely every aspect of life in prison. Everything from uh, the intake of prisoner, how you're supposed, and they are mandatory, how you are supposed to uh, treat prisoners upon intake, uh, how you are going to um, assess their risk, how you're in what institution you're going to place them, uh, what are their health care entitlements, um, what, when do they go to solitary confinement, how they are being to be dis disciplined, what kind of visitation, they, everything, every single moment from the moment when they wake up to the moment when they are going to be released later on is governed by this piece of legislation. That part of it is to ensure that that tension I was talking about between rights and security is kind of maintained and is not at the whim of whoever is uh, at the political will, let's say, right? Um, so as I'm going to, 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 I'm going to focus when I'm talking about this uh, piece of legislation on, on a number of issues. But first I should probably mention the fact that at the moment there are 13,000 people incarcerated in federal penitentiaries across Canada. This number changes from year to year. It's been fairly steady within the last decade or so. 2,000 of these people were, are over the age of 50. Now, why am I saying 50? In prison research, we use 50 as the lower limit of seniority. I know it's very young, but the reason we do that is because empirical uh, uh, data shows that any given prisoner tends to have the problems of a person who's 10 to 15 years older than them in the community. So we kind of lower the age of seniority to, to correspond to that reality, right? So there are about 2,000 people that are incarcerated uh, uh, over the age of 50 in these, in these penitentiaries. Um, again, at all levels of security. And I'm going to talk to you about that more when I get to the portion when I'm discussing my study. Now, um, I just want to point out from the big framework of legislation um, a number of provisions, a number of provisions that I think are particularly impacted by um, what my study brought out or brought up. 
and I'm going to kind of link them to the finding of my study, so just bear with me a bit. Um, one of the very important articles in the Corrections and Conditional Release Act is Section 81. In section 80 and 81 are talking about um, the healthcare provision. So they are guaranteeing the fact, it's very clearly stated, that individuals that are in, federal correction, in the federal correctional system are entitled to um, unlimited access to, uh, to uh, primary health care at the, le the same levels as in the community. And they, are, um, they should have access to a reasonable amount to uh, non-primary health care. And mental health care, the legislation says, is a primary, primary uh, health care issue. So they should be having access to that. Two issues, an issue of access and an issue of quality, should be at comparable levels to those in the community. Um, so we have that on one part, and we also have that coupled with some of the rights in the Constitution. Obviously, the right, there are a number of issues that um, can be linked to health care in terms of constitutionally protected rights, such as the right to be uh, uh, to be free from cruel and unusual treatment and punishment, for instance, when does the lack of health care make tilt into that field? So those are some of the questions that I'm going to go into a little later. Um, the other provisions that I think are important, because I'm going to come back to it then, are the regulation of security measures. Again, remember I was saying the other end of the tension is, is the security needs and the, the obligation to ensure that uh, 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 there will not be a lot of security incidents and that people are going in to get rehabilitated and come out rehabilitated. Um, so one of those issues is the disciplinary system. There is a whole disciplinary system that is put in place. And the provisions are regulating every kind of aspect of that disciplinary moment, from the reasons why you would get a disciplinary uh, action against you, to how you can challenge it, to who's going to represent you, and so forth. Um, and I think the important point for this talk is, is the reason why there is a disciplinary uh, system in prison. And the legislation says very clearly in section 38 and four onwards for those key, um, that um, the reason why we have a disciplinary system is to ensure that the individuals are motivated to behave properly, and that is in turn going to ensure their rehabilitation and successful reintegration in the community upon return to community. So there is that idea that everything that's disciplinary is behavioral trigger, right? Um, and that includes disciplinary uh, solitary confinement as kind of like the, 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 the bigger form of action, uh, disciplinary uh, segregation. For instance, when you're completely isolated for 23 and a half hours a day because you have, and there is a cap in the legislation of no more on paper than 30 days in disciplinary uh, segregation. Now we also have what we call administrative segregation, which is also a form of security. And the legislation says that the reason we have this, it also means sending somebody to solitary confinement, keeping them in pre in, in isolated from uh, 23 to 23 and a half hours a day, uh, no access to other people, no access to, uh, to programs, and so forth. And the reason the legislation says is because you want to ensure that people that are um, are, are continue to present risk for the for the security of the institution are not associated with other individuals that are sort of incompatible. With. So it's not necessarily behavior trigger; it's more preventive to ensure that the uh, security is, is running kind of smoothly. And then the other issue that has some security connotations is the actual level of the security. So we have minimum security institutions, medium security, and maximum security. And make no mistake, the difference between them is enormous. It's very big. Um, to begin with, people that, you know, there is a lot of way more freedom as we go down the security scale, right? Individuals are able to associate more freely. Um, a lot of time they are not locked up. A lot of time they are living in house kind of uh, settings where they can cook their own food. And um, there is definitely a different quality in services as we go down the security level. The, 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 the emphasis kind of shifts from security, investing money in security, to investing money in more rehabilitative activities such as programs, such as visitation, escorts to community, and so forth. Um, normally, and that's a principle that's governing the legislation, is that an individual should not be overclassified. 
Overclassification means when you are placing them in a higher level of security than they should based on their actual risk. And there are a whole bunch of factors that are going into how we are assessing the risk of an individual. But for them, and both of them have to do, in general, it has to do with the crime they had committed at that point and with their personal history, right? Once an individual has been classified, you're normally not moving them to a higher form of security for any other reason than behavioral trigger. So if you cannot manage them in minimum security and they are acting out and they are, you're, that's when you're going to move them up, not for any other reasons. Now we're going to see how these, all of these security issues that I, I've talked about and which in, in theory sound sound, like there is actually a, some reason behind them, can actually be very easily manipulated to respond to other concerns than security or to other things that are not behavior, but they can be in terms of healthcare. And it's all a cycle in the end. And um, I wouldn't want to be understood as saying that it's necessarily uh, Correctional Service Canada's fault or fully co uh, Correctional Service Canada fault or fully the government's. I think we're in a bad situation where prisons are becoming nursing homes and prisons are becoming increasingly uh, places where we see mentally ill people, chronically ill, terminally ill people. We do not have a sound mechanism of releasing these people and integrating them back into the community. So we are left with simply security tools to deal with medical issues, which is on so many fronts wrong. It's wrong in terms of law, it's wrong in, in, in terms of potential for reintegration, and it's wrong in, in terms of community safety ultimately. And we're gonna go through that a bit. The final thing that I want to mention, because before I get into the more juicier part of the actual study, is the constitutional rights. Now we have a Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which is um, part of the Constitution of Canada, and which ensures that the prisoners have, or guarantees that the prisoners have the same rights as any of us have, as long as they are compatible with a limitation in their freedom, right? So, Especially important here are, I've already mentioned the right to be free from cruel and unusual treatment and punishment, but also things like the right um, uh, to life and security of the person in certain, you know, as long as it's compatible with the principle of fundamental justice and so forth. Those are things that are going back to the needs of the individuals, um, uh, the most primary needs of the individuals, right? So we're going to see how that may be, uh, uh, may be affected. So let's talk about the study now. It's fairly interesting because the issue of aging in prison has been a very frequent topic of this discussion over the last 10 years or so in the American literature because there is definitely an aging of the population worldwide, not just prison, like just worldwide. So obviously this is being mimicked in the prison settings, right? And obviously there has been a significant understanding of the fact that aging, were the image of the young, strong prisoner in 25, 30, you know, very healthy, who needs to go to school and better himself and come out and be a productive member of the society, is being completely shifted with the, with the, with the aging of the prison population and the, the demographic uh, worldwide generally, right? So there has been an understanding that maybe what we used to do for a population that was mostly formed out of healthy 30-year-olds might actually not be as suitable for 75-year-olds who are chronically ill and they might see their end of life in prison. So Americans have, who also have, you know, life without possibility of release and so, they have been way faster than we are in researching these issues and looking at them. Now when I started my doctoral work back in 2012, there was no work whatsoever done on the aging of the prison population in Canada, nothing. Despite the fact that it was becoming clear that the rate of individuals aging has doubled within the previous decade, and was at that point at 20% of the whole federal prison population. By the time I finished my doctoral work, four years later, the number of people aging in prison had got to 25%, and we're now headed towards 30%. It's one, and it's interesting because the overall rate of incarceration in Canada has remained steady. So it's interesting because it shows that within the steadiness of the group of people, the only ones that are increasing, it means that the number of young people is decreasing, 
and the number of old people is very rapidly increasing, right? And again, there have been no particular changes to how prisons are operated based on this demographic, and we're going to see what that means based on the study that I conducted. So what I did, I interviewed 200 prisoners, that was roughly 10%. A very significant portion, uh, statistically speaking, of the individuals who are aging in prisons. And um, they were from seven federal penitentiaries in Canada. All of them were based in Ontario. Um, and they were at all levels of security. So minimum, medium, maximum, and an assessment unit. And all of them were male. I did not receive access to females. And that's a whole other can of worms. So all of them were males. I talked to them based on structured interviews. I, 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 I administered some 72 questions that were fairly structured, and they all had to respond to them. And then I quantified them using SPSS, and then I qualified them as well. So I had a, a number of methods of analysis. And the results that have been have, have resulted from my quanta, uh, uh, quantitative and qualitative work is what I'm going to briefly go over with you tonight, OK? And see how that kind of fits with the framework. So, the legal framework that I that I've introduced. Um, so let's see. Let's start with how the older individuals looks. The older individual looks like. So the individual over the age of 50. Now, if you're over the age of 50, chances are that sh you have about 50% chance that you have paroled in prison. So 50% of the sample either were serving a life sentence or were indeterminate sentences, which means that you don't have an end to your sentence, your warrant doesn't expire because you've been, um, and that happens when you've been charged, when you've been convicted of two or more uh, dangerous, violent offenses and the prosecutor has requested that designation. That designation means that you will, you're basically saving a life, a life sentence. Uh, it's just that the possibility of early release may be a little different than for actual life sentences. Um, if you are over 50, you have a 99% chance of suffering from at least one chronic condition. The majority of them being arthritis, diabetes, cancer, um, uh, heart problems, uh, things that are very common within our aging community as well. Um, the particularity was that um, the majority of these individuals were suffering from between four and seven chronic conditions, right? Um, 52% were suffering from a debilitating disability, so that meant that it was impacting their ability, uh, activities of daily living, whether that was walking, going up and down the stairs, getting into bed, washing, and what's not. Um, it also meant it was interesting because it was their disability was statistically correlated with a number of other problematic issues, such as ability to sleep at night, it was correlated with chronic pain, and it was correlated with alcohol abuse. Um, and that brings to chronic pain. As I mentioned, the majority of people suffering from a disability were also reporting chronic pain, but there were also people not suffering from disability that were uh, reported chronic pain, over 50% of them. Um, and when I say chronic pain, for the purpose of this study, I was referring to people who, uh, whose uh, symptoms were not managed by uh, over-the-counter medication, so they need prescription medication, right? These issues were particularly problem, and there are some other issues. For instance, one of them was the fact that 14% of them reported, uh, and probably this was underreported, uh, were incontinent, right? Um, and also, 5% of them were suffering from a terminal illness. So, terminal illness for the purpose of correctional uh, Canada means within six months of living. Um, and I'm going to go back to this category, but just to put it out there, if you're in this five category, chances are you don't have access to a hospice and you don't have access to palliative care. Um, now, chronic pain, disability, incontinence, and were in a very peculiar category of their own. And that category was that of, <laughs> we're placing them in the category of very vulnerable individuals. So there was a lot of peer abuse registered. Um, about 70% of them reported some form of peer abuse, and the rate was double in the people that were suffering from high number of chronic illnesses or from um, incontinence or from disability than people who did not. So that was a significant rate of abuse, and uh, we're going to see what that means for security reasons in a second, but 
I'll just put it out there for now. Uh, so let's see how, we, how the guy over 50 looks like mentally wise. Not great. And again, this is probably underreported. Um, some 45%, 48% were suffering from at least one chronic mental illness. And the majority of them were in the category of chronic depression, uh, significant anxiety, PTSD, schizophrenia, and what was probably one of the most uh, uh, disturbing of them was that there were 5% of my sample reported um, either uh, stage 1 dementia or reported significant cognitive impairment. And this is an interesting and sad group because it's the moment when you look at them and you know that uh, there is nothing that anybody can do. And I'll tell you why. In maximum security, it was one of the guys who was Millhaven maximum security, and he, he had been in for about one year at the point when I was interviewing him. Now, he was in for murder, so he was serving life. The thing about murder is that no matter how your personal history looks like, no matter how, you know, how, your, how your risk, uh, other risk factors are, you know, they might be at the very low bottom, murder itself has such a high uh, high fact, risk factor that it's automatically going to send you for two years to maximum security, regardless of anything else. Just the offense committed, right? So clearly, this guy would have started, regardless of anything else, he would have started his sentence in maximum security and then he kind of goes down. Um, the problem with him, and he was in maximum, was that by the time his trial was done and he finally got into the what they call the mother institution, the institution where you start your sentence, um, he finally was seen and assessed by a psychiatrist, and the psychiatrist said, yeah, well, this guy has a stage one dementia, which is, you know, we've kind of treated as alcohol withdrawal for the last four years, but well, you know, there it is, it's actually stage one dementia, and there's nothing to do. So this guy sits there in front of me, and he cries for the whole hour of the interview. He was particularly panicked, and he said, you know, by the time I'm even done with maximum security, I'm not going to remember my name, let alone what I've done. And, and the problem is that there was no way he was going to be released. Why? Uh, he was serving like the early possibility of release was after 25 years. So there is no way you can apply for early release before your period of parole eligibility comes in. That's 25 years for him. Uh, dementia, even when it takes a while, it doesn't take 25 years to, to set in. Um, and the second issue, in Canada we do not have a functioning mechanism of compassionate release. So we have a thing that's called parole by, by, by exception. Um, if you are serving life, you are not eligible to apply for parole by exception unless you're suffering from a terminal illness. And guess what? Dementia is not a terminal illness. Mm -hmm. So we have 5% of our people who cannot remember their name or what they've done, and they are incarcerated in the federal penitentiaries. And there is no way they can be, there is just no legal mechanism that can be used to be released. Um, we're going to talk in a second about the vulnerability that these individuals are presenting. Um, but I'm going to address them in the terms of treatment and accommodation. Because I think that's particularly important. I mean, the rates of disease and the rates of illnesses, and I could go on, I have pages and pages of that, they are not particularly different than we see in the community. Maybe a little higher because of the previous lifestyles and rigors of incarceration. Again, it's not spectacular. We see that in the community as well. What is spectacular and what is of concern is the availability or the responses that are available for this kind of issues, right? Um, and I'm gonna start with simple things, with the accommodation and the infrastructure. Now, a lot of these institutions are old institutions. They have been built in the 19th century. They have been built in the, some of them. Uh, they have been built in the 20th century. And they are not, many of them are not having disability ramps. Many of them are not having uh, working elevators. Many of them have very long distance in between the buildings. So the individuals are having to walk a very long, a long distance in a record time under threat of punishment to get from their house, for instance, to the programming building or the kitchen or whatnot. And they have to go over these very long yards which explains what 72% of them reporting falling within the last winter on unclean, unclean or um, uh, improperly uh, de-iced uh, pathways because they have to rush through it 
and they are not properly taken care of the, the, the yard. Um, double bunking is a significant problem. These individuals, double bunking is currently over 30% in federal institutions. And it doesn't matter how old you are. The rule is the newcomer is taking the upper bunk. So if you are new to the cell, no matter whether you're 20 or you're 75, you're going to be taking the upper bunk. Now, it also doesn't, it might matter. Because if you have what they call a young bunkie, if you have somebody who's 20 and he's in a gang perhaps, uh, he might not want, even if he's the old person in the room, even if he's the new person in the room, he might not want to go on the top of the bunk. So between a 20 year old and a 75 year old, who do you think is gonna spend the most time on the top bunk? A lot of the top bunks don't even have rails. So you have to, and in one institution, they didn't even have stairs. So this guy had to jump up and down the stairs. He broke his leg twice. It was pretty intense. Um, and in some of the other institutions, the better institutions, the double bunking happens in beds that are side by side as opposed to one on top of the other. The problem is that because they are made for one person as opposed to two people, you could get in and into your bed, but you couldn't get your wheelchair in. So we, remember I was telling that they have like 54% rate of disability. Many of them were in wheelchairs, right? So that would mean you have to leave your wheelchair at the door and you kind of crawl your way into the bed, right? So that's how double banking looks like for a 50-year-old. Um, devices and medical supplies. Now, a lot of times in the community when you're living, if you don't get them from your doctor, you can go and buy them from shoppers. Very easy things that are managing an extra blanket, an extra pillow, heating pads, um, braces, knee braces, orthopedic shoes, different kind of things that are sort of alleviating the different symptoms that you might be having. In most institutions, so we have a very long list of things that can be prescribed with the, uh, with the uh, permission of the warden, such as wheelchair and cane. In many institutions, even those ones are prohibited. And there is a whole list of items that are prohibited in all institutions. For instance, heating pads, uh, braces and stuff like that, you cannot get. That's not an option. Uh, which, which makes things significantly difficult in terms of monitoring systems. Uh, symptoms. Um, the other issue had to do with um, the fact that there weren't any peer caregivers. So again, a 52% rate of people who are suffering from uh, a disability that's impairing their activity of daily living, and yet there were only two institutions that were having peer caregivers. So 16% of the individuals benefited from somebody who was helping them kind of bathe or um, you know, wheeling them around or stuff like that. Um, the problem was that those peer caregivers did not receive a training. So it meant that a lot of time they would be stealing their food, they would be stealing their medication, uh, they would kind of like forget to go pick them up from where they had to be picked up, uh, they forgot where, you know, they misplaced their wheelchairs, a lot of incidents of that. So sometimes you're wondering whether you're not better off without the caregiver. Um, another issue was medication. Over 90% of this group was taking prescription medication. Aside from maximum security, you have to go and pick up your medication in person every day at 7 in the morning. So that meant that you have to line up. You wait for an hour until you get it in line with everyone else. In half of the institutions, the lines were formed outside. So like rain or shine, you had to line up to pick up your medication. Now these were people that were suffering, were picking up their antibiotic for pneumonia. Raining, pouring outside, minus 10, doesn't matter. You have to stand and pick it up. Nobody else can pick it up for you. Not your peer caregiver, nobody else. You know, you have chronic pain, doesn't matter. You have to stand to pick up your Tylenol 3, for instance, right? So this was, and this is something that's happening at Nova, for instance, in the prison for women. The same thing, the line is, I'm not sure how it's at Spring Hill, but I know at Nova for sure, it's the same thing. You have to line up and pick it up in the morning. Now, the other problem is, if you're old and slow, and you have to pick up your medication, uh, sometimes you don't make it for breakfast. Now, imagine that you're a diabetic, by the way, high rates of diabetes, uh, especially in people that have been in prison for like the last decade or so. What you have to do is to have to choose if you go to pick up your insulin medication or if you're eating your breakfast. The problem is you cannot get your insulin without your breakfast. So that was, in one of the institutions, 
I talked about 10 of the guys, and there was no conclusion, no, no outcome to their complaints in that terms. And this seems to be seemingly a very simple thing, very easy to fix. Um, and the other big issue was that the fact that there was no accommodation for dying people whatsoever. Again, 5% individuals uh, were in a terminal stage of life. Um, a lot of times they would not be close to their parole eligibility date. So they wouldn't be at the time where they could actually be released through the regular parole mechanism, the early release mechanism. And for some whatever reason, nobody has ever heard of parole by exception. They would seem to fit squarely within you know, people whose health is not compatible with incarceration. And yet nobody has heard of it. And based on my research in the last 10 years, that particular provision has been used two times in Canada. So despite these huge numbers of people that should not be in prison, the only quasi-compassionate release mechanism that we have is not actually functional. So their options were there is no palliative care, there is no you know, kind of systematic end-of-life care in prisons. So you just take the care that you can get, you're being housed together with anybody else, uh, subjected to the same medication, restrictions and so forth. Now, for the most part, you know, they were kind of trying to, um, uh, for the most part, they were kind of trying to keep them in lower security institutions. Um, there was this one particular institution that was called a death camp because they would have somebody die of natural causes every six months or something. Um, so 70% were over 50 in there and they were, it was definitely with the better conditions, for sure. So they transferred this one guy that everybody in that institution was telling me about. Uh, they transferred him within the month that I was there. And um, they said, you know, he's going to have better access to care and medication and whatnot. The problem is that when you get transferred, your paper record doesn't immediately follow you because that's bureaucracy. So the paper was, his medical record was about a month behind him. This guy was in stage four cancer. He was in unreal pain. For one month, he was one housed together with everyone else, and he didn't receive any medication. Forget morphine. Forget anything else. He was yelling in pain every night. The guys in his house put money together to buy him a bottle of regular Tylenol from the canteen. Now, a bottle of Tylenol is worth one week of work for a regular prisoner. So they all put money together because they didn't know what to do with him. He finally did get some uh, uh, to work. Because I followed up with what happened to him, so he finally, his paper did follow, he got some morphine and then he got like two weeks of chemotherapy and then he died. But, um, yeah, so that was, you know, his, uh, uh, his outcome. Uh, not to mention that it was absolutely devastating on the guys that were witnessing that, right? Like the guys were, were terrified by what they were seeing and they were saying, these were very, very tough people and they were saying, you know, living in prison, I've lived in prison for 40 years, living in prison is not an issue, I don't even have who to go outside to, but dying in prison, I don't want to die in prison, I don't want to get sick in prison, right? So it was that terrifying, uh, rampant fear of what will happen that was clearly having significant effect on their mental health and, and well-being. Um, and we get to medication, which is a very interesting topic because uh, the only painkillers available in prison according to the drug formulary, are Tylenol-3 and morphine. Between them, nothing. So everybody, the default rule is that everybody who has a pain that needs prescription gets Tylenol-3. Now, if you were on something else in the community, good for you, you still get Tylenol-3. Um, in the community, Tylenol-3 is used for mild to moderate pain. Like, I don't know, a tooth abscess or like some mild post-surgery thing. Here, guys that were in fourth stage, in stage four cancer, were getting bad enough. Because that's what they had, and that was secure to use. In some institutions, they would have morphine. There wasn't a particular rhythm to whether they would prescribe morphine or Tylenol 3, even though the difference between them is absolutely huge. Um, one person was in maximum security. He was having a significant concussion after a car accident he had been in, very devastating headaches. He got morphine. Good. It took them two weeks to figure out, even though it was in his record, why morphine was not working. He was a heroin addict. So what did they do? They take him off morphine and they put him on Tylenol-3. Because that's what's available. And it's not surprising that pain efficiency was reported in these people in 20% of the cases. 
So we have over 50% of people reporting chronic pain, horrible uh, pain caused of disability, and statistically correlated to diseases uh, and to uh, physical disabilities, and their efficiency uh, record was 20%. Um, of course, there were a lot of problems regarding the access to specialists and, you know, uh, for the most part, the waiting times were not different in the community. There is also a long waiting time in terms of specialists, so, uh, you know, that was just that. But there were other issues that were different from the community. For instance, there was one psychiatrist available for 600 people in one institution, right? So the question was, if you wanted to see a psychiatrist, the question was, are you suicidal? And if you said no, then you wouldn't be seen. If you said yes, you would be seen and then placed in solitary confinement. Oh, sorry, observation cell. So uh, that was basically, you know, the trajectory. Now, they had also one psychologist, and you were entitled to three sessions with the psychologist for the duration of the stay. This was a medium security. That means that most people stayed there for like 15 years. And the duration of your stay, you got three visits. Um, most other specialists you would see by going to community. So you get an appointment, in the community, you wait like everybody else in the community. It can be a long time. That's you know normal, uh, unfortunately for Canada in general. Um, the problem was that being a prisoner, you need somebody to escort you to your community visit, right? To your doctor, and it has to be an officer normally. So in this particular institution where I told you that it was the death camp, lots of people had community visits uh, to go and see the doctor outside. They had three officers available every day to take them out. So what happened was that if you were the fourth guy having needing an escort that day, for which you waited for like, I don't know, two years, you'd be bumped back to the end of the line because there was nobody to take you back to your community visit. So what it meant is that you were going to back, wait to go back and wait for another two years to see the same doctor if you made it that far, right? So it was just a simple matter of institutional organization in how those things are going to it wasn't even a matter of actual access. It was the matter of actually getting there. Um, and then, of course, there is a chronic shortage. Like half of the institution did not have a 24-7 uh, nurse available. Like, the working hours were between 8 and 5. And if you have a heart attack outside working hours, then you're like, he's not there. One of the guys was describing an heart attack. He had a heart attack in the yard at 8 in the evening, so outside working hours. He had a heart attack. Um, one of his fellow inmates went and grabbed the officer who was at the other end. The officer had no idea how to do CPR. By the way, on paper, policy, everybody's a first responder and they know CPR. Every single one of them. In practice, not so much. So they didn't, they were not able to perform CPR on this person. One of the inmates tried, attempted like desperately to perform some CPR. The problem was that he was not even allowed to call the ambulance, so he went and called the keeper first and asked for the permission to call the ambulance. He got the permission to call the ambulance. Then he called the ambulance. The ambulance, this was a remote location. It's about 45 minutes drive from Kingston. So the ambulance came. So all of this took about an hour. Now the, the thing is that when the ambulance arrived, and this was something that was happening all the time in that institution, because it was a lot of walking to do and the ambulance couldn't get through. So you get there, the ambulance stopped, and they forced the guy to walk to the ambulance. Mm -hmm. yeah. he, he made it, because he, he made it to tell the story. But, uh, I mean, it, it, it puts in perspective why they had death every six months in that place, right? Uh, it might not have all been cancer, let's put it like that, right? Um, now, I'm going to focus, and there is many, many stories that I could, I could tell you about that, but I'm just going to have to stop here for time considerations. The thing that I do want to talk to you about, and that's the last big piece that I want to address, is the issue of, okay, so not only that a lot of these issues are not community standards. Like, as bad as healthcare is in the community, there are still some common sense things that don't happen. You don't wait in line for an hour to pick up your medication. They're not sent to solitary confinement. Um, there are a lot of other things that are, you know, that, that are slightly different, you know, even though access, again, and that's acknowledging that in many parts of, uh, parts of the country, access to healthcare is not necessarily wonderful. Um, but the other thing that's, the other piece that's different and is significant is the fact that not only that the access to, to treatment may not be readily available, but it is being supplemented by security tools. Um, so basically all those security measures that we talked about are actually uh, taken to control behavior that is triggered by health issues. Um, 
So one of the things is disciplinary incidents. Disciplinary incidents were double the amount in people who reported a mental illness compared to people who did not report a mental illness. So why? And, and, and that goes also for disciplinary uh, segregation, and it also goes for any kind of other disciplinary action. So I thought it was particularly interesting because you think, why? Why would you discipline somebody who's sick? Probably they were mouthier. Probably they were complaining more. Probably they were louder. But I think the big piece was the fact that a lot of time, rowdy behavior was act Their sick behavior was misinterpreted as being rowdy behavior. So a lot of times, um, they, because they have such a shortage of psychiatrists and such a problem in even correctly diagnosing diseases, they would fail to have that piece in, to have the correct diagnosis, and they would simply be treating it as rowdy behavior. And hence, they were uh, disciplining them. Now, remember that we said that the disciplinary action is supposed to help with the rehabilitation and the reintegration of the individual in the community because you're giving this incentive to them, right? This penalty that if you, if you misbehave, you're going to be penalized and you're not going to have all these things that are helping you to get back to the community. Individuals who are mentally ill and the cause is internal, obviously this is not working for them. On the contrary, you're sending them to solitary confinement, which is now known to have devastating effects on mental health problems. Uh, you are not helping them rehabilitate. On the contrary, disciplinary actions are going on the record. So what it means is that it's, um, it's in your way of accessing early release. Like it's actually a factor that's against you if you have disciplinary uh, tickets. Uh, it's uh, going to count against you in going to a lower level of security where you might have access to better doctors, you might have access to better programs, um, and all of those things that are sort of getting you closer to the goal of rehabilitation and release, right? So, but by the fact that it's treated as disciplinary action, you're actually moving them away from that goal, right? The same thing with, with administrative segregation. And this is interesting because administrative segregation was used not only double in the people that were, uh, were suffering from a mental illness, but also administrative segregation was uh, statistically more used for people who were suffering from more chronic conditions, physical chronic conditions. So it was not only associated statistically with mental issues, but also with chronic issues. Again, the question why? Well, with mental illness, probably because they were misbehaving. Probably because, again, they were misdiagnosed. But with chronic illness, it wasn't clear to me for a while. And I think the reason is because they are heightened vulnerability. So people with mental illnesses, for instance, were 70% 70, 70 of people reporting mental illnesses uh, also reported significant peer reviews compared to 40% who didn't report mental illness, right? So they were significantly at higher risk of abuse. And the same with people reporting four to seven chronic conditions compared to those who reported less than that, who are double the risk of abuse. And it was probably the reason, their vulnerability, they were placed in solitary confinement to kind of protect them from that abuse, to kind of ensure that they are not being attacked. Now the problem with that, remember we talked about administrative segregation as being you're isolating the person who's doing something to kind of protect the rest of them and to kind of preemptive any kind of you know, misbehavior to ensure that there's more security, because also administrative segregation has a lot of negative effects on the mental health itself, but you're also deprived of programs, you're also deprived of visitation, it also goes on your record and you cannot access um, the early release opportunities as well, right? So it is essentially, even though it's called administrative segregation, it is a form of punishment, for sure, right? So what you do, you take the most vulnerable person that you have in your, in your institution, that is vulnerable to being attacked, you place them in a solitary confinement with all these effects that it's having, and again, it's deterring them from accessing the programs, the healthcare, and everything else that they are needing, right? So again, you have that opposite effect as opposed to what you would be wanting to achieve by treating them. Um, and there are a number of other forms of hidden forms of solitary confinement. One of them is protective custody, for instance. Protective custody, we only find it at high forms of security, generally maximum security, for the Paul Bernardos of the world. So, some we call, there is protective custody that's called no contact and contact. No contact is really very significant. Um, a lot of the, uh, the, the, the most horrific, for the most horrific crimes, it would 
really not survive a day in prison because they have a target of, of, on their back. They are going to be placed in protective custody. For the duration, Paul Bernardo never came out of protective custody, right? Like he's there, he's in no contact, nobody, he only talks to the officer in charge and that's all. Uh, there have been many attempts to kill him, it's not very surprising, you know, and if you put him in a contact, he's gonna die. There is no way about it. So you kind of put them there because of the crimes they committed and to protect them. Very stigmatizing. Even if you're not a well-known person, if you are placed in protective custody, they're automatically gonna assume you're akin to Paul Bernardo and Cliff Olsen and all those guys, right? So you come out of it, you're dead. There is no place about it. Now, a lot of the guys I was telling you about in maximum security, they end up in maximum security after years of trial and after, you know, because of the crime they've committed, not necessarily because of their risk level, such as murder, for instance. Not particularly stigmatized in the Paul Bernardo kind of category. But they, put, they get placed in protective custody because they are very vulnerable, because they suffer from dementia or whatnot, right? They are automatically assumed to be in the same category, so they will never be released. So most of the guys I talk to, 70% incidents of mental illness, they're gonna spend the next 25 years in protective custody. Even though, you know, they may have nothing to do with the horrific crimes that some other individuals have committed. It's simply a matter of fact that there is no other way to protect them, and there is no other way to release them. Um, transfers to higher forms of security, that's the last point, quite an issue. As if you remember when we talked about the legislation, it's fairly clear that you shouldn't be transferring people to higher forms of security than the ones that they were initially classified, unless you cannot manage them behaviorally, right? Um, and let's say that the correctional service applies is very literal. So I'll give you one example. This fellow was suffering from dementia. He was probably no more advanced stage than stage one. Um, but he worked his way through all the way to minimum in his time. He's been in for a long time, some, I don't know, 15 years. So he developed dementia while in prison. And he worked his way all the way from maximum to minimum security. So he was like kind of like home run, right? When he, his dementia was flaring up really badly. So um, he got really confused at the night he was a wanderer. So he became really confused. He didn't remember what he was doing. He was going um, from room to room. He was bothering everybody else. He was still quite a bit away from his release time. Um, there was really nothing to, to be done for him. So what they did, they upped him to maximum security so that they can lock him up. And that way they could put him in solitary confinement and they don't have to worry about it. Um, so a very significant increase in the transfer to higher forms of security used in response to mental illness or in response to dementia in particular because it is a way of managing behavior because you have, in minimum security, there is no solitary confinement. It's a very open living concept, right? Um, everybody's living, in, like people are living in houses and they can move around. It's kind of mimicking uh, the community so they can ease their reintegration, right? Uh, you don't have fancies or anything like that, right? Also, people don't have a lot of incentive to run because, well, they get brought back and back to me. Right? So it's a pretty open environment. Um, so that's why they are using transfers, not because their actual risk has increased or because they are more likely to affect, but rather because they cannot manage their behavior, they cannot treat it, they cannot release them, so there is no other way than use security tools to control it. And I think the thing that I've done most work with is release, and I don't have time, this is a different topic for a different day, because I think that for me the biggest issue is, is the issue of release because correctional institutions are not nursing homes, nor should they be. Um, they are not hospices, they are not, you know, yes, there are some common sense things that should be changed to reflect the population. I mean, it's actually not that hard to put some disability ramps and, uh, you know, to change the infrastructure to be able to, and to put the lines to form inside instead of the outside and, you know, a lot of other examples that would make a lot of difference. But I think ultimately the question becomes why are we incarcerating, why are we continue to incarcerate these people in, in the first place um, in the moment when they are so brought down by, like, when their own mental state and physiology is making them incompatible with reoffending ever again. And the answer is simply the fact that we don't have mechanism to release them. And we seem to be comfortable with that. We don't seem to mind that there is there is a gap between the risk of people that we have in prison and their ability to be released. 
So there is a very important study that had been conducted by one of my mentors in Toronto a few years ago, and it was showing, he's a statistician, criminologist, and it was showing that if early release was abolished altogether in Canada, right now, the prison population would increase by only 4%. Early release is extremely little use. So that image when people get really upset in the media saying like, what, he's only getting like, you know, uh, life with 25 years before being released, that's, that's not true. Most people don't get released after 25 years. I've seen people in prison for 45 years. So they say, no, life should mean life. Actually, you know what? Life kind of means life. Uh, some people get released, it's not the norm. They will get released eventually, yes, some of them. Most of them will eventually get released unless they die in prison. But, um, it's not going to be after 25 years. It's not going to be on the first uh, parole eligibility date. It's going to take quite a long time, actually. Um, and the reason is because, for instance, and I think it's actually working against older people, because the conditions that you have to meet on your first parole eligibility or second parole eligibility or whatever, you have to prove that you have been, you know, you are taking responsibility, that you've rehabilitated and you're ready to reintegrate. Which, in, in, in theory, they sound really good. And I think, yes, that's a great, Goal. The problem is that they are being, and the initial, the factors that they are considering to see that have to do with, have you done all your programs? Were you sociable? Um, do you have a plan after your release? Do you have a job lined up for you? Do you have community support? And again, that might have been great for a healthy 30-year-old. That might work really well. When you're 75-year-old and dying, completing a correctional plan might not really be your main priority. Or finding a job for when you're released. So a lot of those criteria, the, and those are the set of criteria that parole boards are taking into account. So a lot of times these people are not actually available, don't have this avenue even when they reach parole eligibility date. The other issue is that the very things that are making them incapable of being a risk, such as the fact that they are, I don't know, they are bedridden, they cannot move at all, or they have dementia, are not being taken into account. They are not factors considered on release. They're not factoring in at all. Um, and the other issue, of course, is the fact that we don't have a compassionate release system. Sure, you know, maybe all of these criteria, we could keep them for younger, healthier individuals, probably with quite a bit of reform as well, but still, and have a better compassionate release system in place that is taking into account only health and issues like that. Well, we don't have that. Again, none of the guys in my study has ever heard that parole by exception would even be an option, right? So very significant issues in terms of their possibility of release. So I think the question becomes, you know, why, what does it mean? I mean, it's horrific. When, when you hear about it, it sounds really bad. And it is really bad. And, you know, other than the moral and the ethical considerations for this, there are also a lot of legal implications. But there are also legal implications not necessarily for the Correctional Service Canada or for the individuals who are incarcerated. But there are a lot of implications for us as a community. And granted, prisoners are not a sympathetic group of people. It's always very hard to advocate on behalf of prisoners. And it's always very hard um, uh, to, to make the public sympathetic because they are not. Many of them are actually hardened criminals. And they, you, know, you see them in the news, and they are people you wouldn't want to hang out with. Um, but how I like to explain this is think of what, you know, for instance, the law and the charter are. Um, think of what the Constitutional is meant to do, right? The Constitution is not necessarily meant to protect, is not in place to protect the persons who are the majority at the moment in time. Because that's what the parliamentarily elected people are doing. That's why your democratic process, it's always going to reflect the values and what the individuals that have put them in power, the majority, is wanting, right? That's what, you know, uh, is ensuring that the reason why we have a charter of rights in a democracy is to protect the people we don't like. And that's what's speaking about the quality of the democracy. You don't have to like them. I don't like a lot of the people that I've seen, but it's not about that. It's about protecting fundamental and ultimate values that are guaranteed by Constitution. Because if their rights are being breached, any of our rights can be breached. Because it means they don't mean anything. Whether we're women, whether we are people of color, whether we are LGBTQ plus community, whether we are elderly, whether we are young, 
whether we are on the wrong side of the politics at the moment in time. It means that if one group of people can be deprived of rights and you know basically nobody's looking, that can happen to anybody. So the strength of a democracy comes essentially from forcing the laws to be respected and applied appro appropriately, even when we don't believe in that cause necessarily, even when we don't care about that cause necessarily. That was democracy is. Um, the other issue that has to do it, it, is the fact that, and people don't think about it, is that the failure to apply the law appropriately in prisons means that pe ill people are not being diagnosed correctly. It means that they are not really receiving the programming and the rehabilitation they need to make them functional citizens. And many of them will come back into the community. Like, de a decreasing number, I would say, with the uh, increase of terminal illnesses. But still, a good 90% at some point in their life are going to come out of prison and they are going to be our neighbors. And we want our neighbors to be stable people who have rehabilitated and who, who can be productive members of the society. If you're putting them in a prison environment that is actually failing to diagnose the problem that they have, failing to provide them with the treatment they have, fail to take their rights into consideration, you're actually producing more unstable people. You are producing, you are having exactly the opposite effect of what the system is supposed to be doing. So again, people think through a lot of vengeance. A lot of times the public opinion is very vengeful. And you know, they, they think a lot in terms of, well, you know, if you can't do the time, you shouldn't have done the crime. Well, Great, but the, the thing is that they will come back and that you've mistreated them significantly in prison and they're not going to be better. They're not going to be better individuals in the community. And you kind of just shoot yourself in the leg with that. You've just invested a lot of money in somebody, making somebody you think is bad worse. So it's not a sound decision. And thirdly, and people don't, and I don't like to talk about money because coincidentally I actually believe in this cause, so I do believe in the human and moral dimensions of these issues. I've also met wonderful wonderful, wonderful prisoners, aside from, you know, so the image of that beast is not necessarily accurate. But that being said, um, and that's, I guess, a different conversation, but that being said, there is also a very pragmatic dimension to this. And that, do you know how much it costs to keep somebody in a federal prison? It costs, for a healthy person, healthy, no health care, no solitary confinement, it's $100,000 a year. To keep somebody who is sick in prison, in solitary confinement, either sick or in solitary confinement, is three hundred thousand dollars a year. Do you know who's paying for that? Mm -hmm. Us. To keep somebody in a nursing home, it costs fifty thousand dollars a year. Right? Again, you're keeping somebody who's not sick, who 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 has a very low risk of reoffending, and who you're basically keeping them because your mechanisms, your laws are not functioning properly. And because the public opinion is against any kind of reforms. And a lot of the tough on crime agenda had to do with the situation in which we are now. Because it was catering to that outcry of keeping communities safe. And guess what? We're not. We're not keeping communities safe. At all, in fact. We are doing that. And we're doing that at the cost of significant mental, human uh, well-being. And we are kind of devaluing ourselves and our rights in the process as well. So I'm, I'm going to stop here. I'm welcoming any comments, any thoughts on that. Um, and welcome. I'm happy to expand on any of the things that I've talked about. You were saying that there's uh, 2,000 people over the age 50 across Canada. You would ex I'm thinking that's probably going to be Oh, it already has increased. 2000 was at the time when, in 2012, when I was looking at that, um, and that was roughly 20 or 21 percent. So right now, if we're at like, and when I finished, it was 25 percent. Now it's about 26, 27 percent. So that would be, yeah, that would be uh, 2,500 something like that right now. So it definitely would have increased by the, since then, and it's definitely increasing because we're heading towards 30 percent. And the reason why that happened, like it cannot stop, and the reason why it cannot stop is because the tough on crime agenda and bills, many of them are still in place, so we're still doing that. The release system is not any better than it was in 2012. And 
and the other, uh, the demographic continues to age worldwide, right? So there is no way that this can, can stop unless something is being done actively about it. And there's some um, European country, I don't remember which one, that has been showing that um, they have a whole different way of treating uh, prisoners. Um, have you looked into that and is that possible to bring that kind of system here that they're doing there, that they're treating them like humans? Right. So, I mean, um, yes, I, the first part of your question is yes, I, I did look into it because that's actually I did my master in comparative prison law, so I compared it to I'm originally from Europe, so um, I did a lot of work with the European Court of Human Rights, and they actually do have they expanded a lot of the understanding of what cruel and unusual means as it applies specifically to conditions of confinement. We have not really done that in Canada, even though the provision sounds the same. We don't really use it in the same manner. There's definitely it's interesting because uh, and that's a, that's a peril. Um, I think the thing that should be done, that's the most comparable to you, that should be done in the same manner as it's done in some European countries, um, is to actually maintain the same service within the justice system as it is for the non-prisoners. I don't think I've seen any other area of law or any other category of people where a double standard is used more than with prisoners when it comes to the application of charter rights. And that's another area of research that I'm looking at, so it's a bit beyond the scope of today's talk. But definitely, the way their charter rights are being applied and, and upheld in court is very different than if they are not prisoners. And there are also other implications in terms of the access to justice and um, other issues like that. So that would already be a very significant change. In terms of, can you, know, can you transplant conditions of confinement? Um, I think it's hard because a lot, like the, car the countries that you're talking about are Nordic countries. Um, they are significantly smaller in number, like they have a less population, their sentencing system is very different, and also they are more um, homogeneous. Um, there isn't as much of a diversity and as many other issues that are, that are kind of impacting the way the system is set up. Um, so I think that it's, it's difficult, like, it's probably not fully transplantable because of these all different considerations, um, but can there thing, can, can there be things that we can learn from them? Absolutely. And that has to do especially with the ability to, you know, compassionate release and uh, to the ability to, to reshape our sentencing system in a different manner. And I mean, ultimately, I think that what those examples are standing for is the fact that you can have a more humane system. You can have a system that's more focused on decarceration and reintegration in the community without actually uh, putting in danger the safety of the community, because that's the rhetoric that we're hearing in, in, uh, from politicians, that they are saying that this is not, and it has to be done like this because it's making us safer. Well, research is showing that it's actually not making us safer. Um, and in the meanwhile, the other countries are doing a much better job at keeping their community safe and you know, instilling respect for everyone's rights. Do you think it's part of the moving it to a for-profit model that this rhetoric is at the basis of, like it is in the States? Well, I hope not, and I don't think so. I, 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 I hope, I mean, even in the, in the States, um, the for-profit model has started to decline, and it's actually starting to reduce in number significantly. And the reason for that is because they had a very significant issue in applying the, a lot of the regulations that would apply to state actors, including constitutional considerations, would not apply to this not-for-profit. So it was really hard to, uh, sorry, to these for-profit organizations that were like private prisons, right? So it was actually significantly difficult to control them, but what was also more difficult was that the standards in some of them were significantly lower. Um, and without any kind of legal accountability, right? So uh, the movement in the, it's interesting, because we're seeing in the states a movement of uh, kind of m moving more towards a more humane process. They're still very far away, but you know, that's kind of the trend, even in the, the current political uh, uh, regime, where in Canada we're seeing exactly the opposite, right? You may have answered this question, but did you, in your research, notice differences in the uh, level of care given or provided in? Yes, absolutely. So that was also an 
another issue, right? A lot of times, actually, and not only depending on security levels, sometimes simply some institutions were purely better. They had better staff, the correctional officers were just nicer people in general. You know, I appreciate the work that correctional officers have to do. It's a hard work. You know, some of them are really nice people, but in some institutions, the, it's, you make you, it makes you wonder how did somebody lose their humanity like that. It's, to a certain degree, it's better because clearly the rule of law has made significant progress since the 80s, uh, but you see a lot of abuse still going on. And again, in some other institutions, like the one that I was telling you that's called the death camp, you know, um, the, the care that, you know, the quality of the people that were there was significantly better. Uh, the quality of the, the, there were more access to medical care. Uh, the officers themselves, like, the way officers treat you, they are the first responders. It's making such a big difference. Right? And what happened is that either they became the same under peer pressure or they quit. Because there was no change in that environment. And in other institutions, in the institution that I told there were 600 people, for instance, again, and they would say, I would ask them, that was a specific question, how are your guards treating you? And many of them said, you know what? Most of them are just, like, are just mean by negligence. Like, they just ignore you, they don't care. And, you know, sometimes it's better. Some of them are really nice. And you have two bad apples that are really horrible people, but they are gonna make all your life miserable. And you're hitting that blue wall of silence and you cannot get past because nobody's going to speak against them, right? And these guys in, in the institution where it was a medium high, there were 600 people, a lot of people had wheelchairs, and what they, the officers would do, they would play pranks on the individuals and they would tie the wheelchairs to the table. So if the, when the guy was sleeping, for instance, he would go in and he would tie the wheelchair and the guy could not access his wheelchair. Or he would take the wheelchair and he would put it in somebody else's uh, cell. And you didn't know where it was. Just things like that that are, so I mean, certain things did not depend from one institution to another. For instance, access to Tylenol free, that was all there was. Like that's a national regulation, that's all you get. How many psychiatrists you have employed? That's a national regulation that already is. But the quality of the people employed and the environment is significantly different. And it did make a difference in the quality of their life, and it did make a difference proximity to town. That was an important part because the closer you were to town, the faster the ambulance arrives, you know, the more, like, it's, it's a different kind, the more volunteers you get, you know, that kind of thing. Like, it's not unlike here. Spring Hill is very far from Halifax. Very few, very, very few volunteers in Spring Hill. Nova has significantly more because it's closer and it's in also in a, cent in, a, in, a, in a more urban center, right? So the same, it depends on so many other factors, right? Is there anybody within the system who advocates for better health care for prisoners? I mean, you know, I'm, I'm sure there is. There are great people working with Correctional Service Canada. I, I've worked with a lot of great people with Correctional Service Canada. Um, and again, sometimes it's not just about them per se. It's also more like the governmental bureaucracy, the funding that is available, and simply a, not a well-thought system that needs to be rethought completely. Um, there definitely have been people, and there is a lot of individual workers that, you know, occupational therapists that I've met, or like nurses or doctors that are wonderful, compassionate people, and they do the best that they can with it. But again, their hands are tied. Like a doctor cannot prescribe what he or she wants. A doctor prescribes what's available. And if you prescribe something else, tough luck. That's that, you know, like you're not going to have, you're, you can, their hands are tied from so many points of view, right? So. Um, there are people who are advocating and there is, you know, um, we see them all the time and in, for instance, there is in, in BC, that's a provincial institution though, it's Ruth Martin who was a, a, a prison hospital who's now one of the biggest prison advocates and she's created amazing programs for the women there. Again, that's provincial, that's not federal, but similar people do exist, you know, and they are trying. The problem is that um, I think one of the biggest issues is the fact that you're working with a machinery in which everything is cover up. A lot of it is covering and the, the first response is always very defensive. When you're when you're trying to face them with you know some limitations or you're trying to show them the results of the study and you try to sit them down and talk to them, the first response is always defensive. You don't understand, you don't know, it's security, you have no idea, you know, 
it's always that response first. And a lot of the communication gets lost in the paper trail. So again, it's not one individual, it's a system. And I think the bigger problem comes with the lack of access to justice for many prisoners and uh, the lack of legal resources to self-represent or have a representation in prison and to challenge, actively challenge the conditions in which they, they are incarcerated or their lack of access to release or things like that. I mean, I think we're past the moment when we're hoping for the parliament to change something. I, I think we're past the moment. Mm -hmm. I think that there is a need for a bit more active intervention. Um, yeah, and that's the other part of the work that I'm doing, a bit more active courts and lawyers and all of that, because I think, uh, I, I, I don't see a huge swamp being uh, legislative reform. I mean, we keep waiting for it. And but there does seem to have been, I don't know what you would call it, that lessening of, or a bit of a wind of change, maybe a breeze of change, since the government changed, uh, that's, I mean, from my very limited experience, you know. Like no, I think you're right. the CAC, that seems to be what people who work in, within the correctional system. No, I think you're right. Yeah. And, uh, no, I, I agree with you. Like, I mean, I, I think that, that, and again, that has to do a lot with the obligation that you're setting on people. I think that the, uh, again, even the current government has inherited a very flawed system, right? So it's only so much you can do to be in terms of an overwhelming reform. I do think things have changed, and things can change in terms of who are you hiring, who are you hiring in key positions. So I have also seen uh, quite a bit of change in terms of uh, the relaxation, in terms of you know how officers are behaving. More allegations of abuse are coming out uh, from officers, either against their fellow officers or against prisoners. So a lot of things like that are actually starting to, 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 uh, to shape up. And there have been also some more successful cases. So I think the combination of the government, and there is a bit more um, prison advocacy lately, in the last 10 years, uh, five to 10 years, I would say. So definitely there is a wind of change. Definitely people are starting to understand more, to listen more, to be engaged more, a lot of advocacy groups, a lot of push through the courts. So I do see that a lot. And I do think that it's a better time than it has ever been in terms of pushing for a recognition in terms of what we're doing to others. And um, also, you know, the current government is doing a criminal justice reform. So again, I'm always, you know, cautious. Let's say I'm cautiously optimistic, right? So I, I, I definitely think it's better than when I started the study. Like, that's not just no comparison, you're right. Yes, I mean, and it's all you can hope in terms of, you know, what can be done. I think it's more about changing and shifting attitudes that's going to be really hard. Uh, professor, you uh, mentioned in your presentation that <clears throat> the only opportunity for a life sentence to be commuted would be a terminal illness, I believe. Um, so it's not about, yeah, so I, I was talking not about being committed, committed through uh, the compassionate release system. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so we have a number of options of release. Okay. Um, and you mentioned that about 5% of the population in prison at any time is terminally ill. Oh, right now, not at any time, but yes, yeah. like in the last year. Right. So what would be the criteria, or what point in the terminal illness would you meet the criteria for an early release? Right, so there are, so... For the early release in the sense of parole, the regular parole system, their terminal illness is not counting at all. So the regular system where you have to have, for instance, parole eligibility of, ineligibility of five years. When you met the five years, you can apply for your parole, and then you have to show signs that you are taking responsibility, that you're rehabilitated and ready to integrate. Your terminal illness is counts for very little. They may look at it, but it's not something that's generally a factor. Now, if you want it to count, like if you want to be otherwise released, you have to apply through Section 121, which is called Parole by Exception. So that, it's, that section is broad in that it says, um, if you're suffering from a terminal illness, or if your health is incompatible with incarceration, or it's likely going to significantly deteriorate while you're in prison, you may be um, eligible to try and apply to be released by this Parole by Exception, which is mostly based on health, right? But then it goes on and it says, now, if you are serving a life sentence or an indeterminate sentence, the only way you can benefit from this 121 is if you are actually terminally ill. And then you look at their guidelines and their guidelines say you have to be like, basically, they, they are adopting a lot of the language from nursing homes 
even though they are not nursing homes, and they are saying, you know, if you're within six months of that. So basically, and here's the difficulty, because let's say that you that you're, you meet otherwise the criteria, you're within six months of that. And you're, the reason why a lot of these guys do not get them is because when they knew about it and they applied because they were, you have to apply the moment when you start, like when a doctor says, yeah, this guy is really terminally ill, probably he doesn't have more than six months to leave, you know. So you have to have the prison physician, you might have a second opinion, and then you apply. So it has to be at the moment. The problem is that it takes forever. So a lot of the guys that did apply died during the application. Like it never happened, it takes more than six months. So that's another issue in the system, right? Like you have to be within six months of dying, but there is no expediency. So the parole board doesn't have a different section that only deals with parole by exception. They deal with all of them together. And there is no emergency procedure for parole by exception. You just get all your parole applications and when you get to it, you get to it. And it might take a little longer because like, oh really, are you really within six months? Maybe we need another opinion, maybe we need another assessment, maybe you need more paper. Where are you gonna go? Who's the nursing home that's gonna take you? You know, all of those kind. Really, let's hear from your family. Let's hear from this, let's hear from that. But you know, this paper wasn't filled right. So all of those things. They're also not very used to this system because they haven't done a lot of that. There is no clear guidelines on how to deal with that. So when a particular parole board faces it, it's like, oh my God, what are we doing now with this guy, right? So a lot of issues like that arise, which are ending them like they die by the time they even get to hear the situation. So that's another flaw. And I think what's very interesting in terms of this is because now we have assisted dying in, in, in community and in prison as well. And what we're pushing for now, uh, me and some of my colleagues, we're looking at trying to get them to consider terminal illness, at the very least, or conditions for release to be similar to the language that is being used for medical assistance in dying, which are talking about foreseeable death. And it's, that's definitely longer than six months. I mean, you are eligible to apply for assisted death. In, there was a recent case in Ontario where the guy was 10 years away from death but he was in horrible pain and he was granted by court uh, permission to, to, to get assisted dying. Even though by a strict interpretation of the current legislation, 10 years would be too long. So there is definitely this movement towards having very broad periods of time in which you can apply for assisted dying. And yet, if you're in prison, you have to be within six months of death. So what, you're eligible for assisted dying but you're not eligible to be released because you're sick? So it doesn't make a lot of sense at all, right? So that's, you know, um, that, that's a very big disconnect between the different legislations. I was wondering if I could ask you a question about dementia. Mm -hmm. um, dementia, particularly dementia as a result of Alzheimer's, is a progressive disease. Yes. And a senior prisoner who is suffering from dementia will eventually reach a point where they're no longer aware of, aware of why they were incarcerated or even at the fact they are incarcerated, they may not know where they are. Could not the argument be made at that point that the point of incarceration, at least the punitive point of incarceration, is now mute, or excuse me, moot, because the prisoner doesn't know where they are or why they're there. What's the point of incarceration? Because part of that is punitive. No, exactly, and, and that's something that that's you know part of the work that I've done, saying that um, the principles for release should mirror the principles for sentence. So, you know, if you're taking these factors into consideration when you're sending somebody to prison and their life circumstances change during that, and it's interesting because one of my studies, I was looking at what happens when an individual goes before a judge during sentencing and he presents exactly this criteria that they're being brought by some other people before the parole board. And as it turns out, according to that study that I've done, judges are significantly more likely to take into account issues such as already ongoing dementia or uh, other chronic illnesses. So if you are a judge, if you are lucky enough to have been diagnosed with dementia at the time of sentencing, the judge will take that into account if, if there isn't a minimum sentence, mandatory minimum sentence, of course. But if there isn't one, the, your sentence is going to look significantly different because you have those factors. And yet, if you develop them during the prison time, the parole board is not going to take that into account at all. So that the problem is, yes, I think you're absolutely right, and I do think you 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 hit the nail in the head with that, the fact that you know there is a problem, and I do believe that it's actually mute, the issue is mute. And I do think that there is a strong argument to make that the purpose of incarceration are not no longer uh, no longer met. The problem is that nobody's listening. A friend of mine in Alberta um, 
had advanced stages of Alzheimer's. He murdered his wife. He was shown to be incompetent, but he's still in a lockup facility charged with criminal charges. So he, he, he went through the whole court system not knowing what the hell went on and doesn't know that he murdered his wife, which is a good thing. Upstanding citizens in the community, these, these two were joined at the hip. Um, and he's, he's in the system. Oh. And again, it goes back to the fact you and I, obviously you cannot just release people randomly. Like you need to have a system on how to do it, and we do have a system on how to do it. It's just not reflecting the realities that we're facing. So conclusion is that the system needs to be reformed. Now we'll see. We'll see what you know what will happen. I mean, at the moment to to talk about the reform, I, uh, you know the hum, the Senate's Human Rights Committee is actually looking specifically into the vulnerable groups of people. Um, I appeared before them two weeks ago, and they seemed very interesting in this issue. They asked me to provide more details and to provide them with a draft of a new compassionate release provision. So they are interested in it, you know, and it's going to make its way into, its, into their reform, into their report. I do believe that. Now, what happens with their report? It's anyone's guess, right? So, again, definitely more interest, definitely more. Um, this government has been more willing to appoint independent senators that are more willing to go into these committees and to look at these issues. It's, you know, the legacy of what will happen is to be assessed. 